Uh, um, so how much is that? So. All right, welcome everybody to the podcast editor's mastermind, the podcast geared towards the business side of podcast editing. And today we have a very interesting show. It's actually the last episode of the year. And today we're going to be talking about the podcast taxonomy and challenges and supercharged growth in your business. But before we get into that, let's introduce our fellow Yetis. I'm Daniel, RothMedia.audio. I'm Jennifer, Bourbon and Barrel Podcasting. I'm Brian. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. And I'm Carrie from yayapodcasting.com. Awesome. So if you have been paying attention, I post a link to it in the Podcast Editors Club. But recently, the podcast taxonomy, and you can go to podcast taxonomy, I hope I'm saying that right, mm -hmm. .com, and you can download the white paper. And essentially what it is, is they've defined the roles within podcast production. So any kind of initial thoughts on it from you guys? I mean, part of my initial thought is it's a good thing that it's being done, right? Because we've had mm -hmm. a lot of discussions around what does editing mean to you? And it means something different to everybody, but I'm not 100% sold on it. Carrie, you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say that it is very clearly influenced by the larger media companies and production houses and traditional media. I don't necessarily think that's a horrible thing. It's difficult to like define podcasting because it's such a broad thing. Yeah. But like the roles are pretty much like the similar for most podcasts. Like essentially there's one person doing like all the role. Yeah. And I think that the indie podcaster, the feedback I've heard is like, why is it relevant to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. Like there's a disconnect between what I see as like the majority of podcasts versus like the reality of like this paper, which is obviously influenced by the much larger production houses. But when it comes to like my clients and what I do, like I work with typically solo hosts that may do an interview. So like a lot of these roles like aren't relative, at least like when it comes to like where the money is, like the bigger shows are going to have these roles, but to like the larger number of podcasts, like it's kind of irrelevant. Yeah. I don't usually think fully artists when I think podcasts. Now for an audio drama, something real high level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when I think what are some roles of podcast production, fully artist is not one that comes to mind. But no, there is. and I think it speaks to what they're trying to do, right? There's a breadth to what they're trying to do because I think they're trying to address the audio drama or the fiction podcast, mm -hmm. as well as the narrative style show with a writer and remote recording engineers, like all of that stuff. So a lot of those roles are, I think, fairly well communicated, I think. But the thing that kind of gets me is I don't know that I can necessarily call myself an audio engineer from a post-production mm -hmm. standpoint. That's but, why there's just audio editor for you. But right, I don't but think you're doing audio the, editor describes what I do. But you're doing the engineering, the mixing, and the mastering, right? We're dealing with all the audio pieces in post-production. Right. And I think, but the way they had it defined, engineer is a, all about pre-production or the actual production. So the engineer is the recording. And, or like if it was music, it'd be the tracking engineer, not the mixing, editing, and mastering engineer. That's how it was defined. So just real quick, they define post-production engineer, evaluates audio technologies and their application okay. as it pertains to the final steps of production and publication, which to me seems like super vague. Well, it seems like mastering, like really, doesn't it? That's, that's how I took it. It could, Either yeah. like mastering or like, I guess, yeah, the final steps of production. So right. yeah, mastering. Right. And, and I guess like the, I also kind the, of, go ahead. Oh, it's going to be like the assembly. So you've got all the tracks are processed, they're edited, they've got the like basic mix on it, and then you put it all together, and then you master it for a publication is what that, yeah. that mm -hmm. could be. So, But it also says that the audio editor may also perform general audio processing and mastering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a tiny bit vague. I think probably by design at this point, right? 
because yeah, they are trying to bridge the gap. Kind of appreciate that it's kind of all encompassing. Yeah, but then it makes you think that, like, wow, I'm doing all these jobs. <laughs> right. Well, And, like, and it, it, it's it, almost, like, funny to think that, like, anybody would hire different people, right, to do all these things with, <laughs> with, with an episode. <laughs> yeah. And, and I guess kind of where my head was, like, and I realized this is, like, not my higher <laughs> response. This is not my most mature response. But my first thought was... Of all of these roles, it seems like the audio editor is like the least senior of anybody in terms of their responsibility. And that's what I'm currently calling myself. But there are a bunch of shows that I work on that they literally would not happen without somebody doing what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is way more than just top tail and ads, right? Yeah. Right. So audio editor, they define as the audio editor cuts and rearranges audio for clarity and storytelling purposes. The audio editor may also perform general audio processing and mastering. So when I first read that, the way I interpreted it as like the creative directors or like, you know, the people kind of higher up on this list are making the decisions and then like sending the audio editor like timestamps like, hey, you do this, move this here, do that, and then send it back to me. So it's almost just kind of like grunt work and not necessarily like any kind of skill involved other than knowing how to move around. One and I don't the, think that's a role of like an audio editor. I don't agree with that. But that was my initial interpretation of their definition. Right. And one of the things I've been learning from the fellowship about the more highly produced and kind of the, I guess, for lack of a better word, the more corporate, the traditional media, the way they put podcasts together, that the audio editor does have an editorial role, right? So they're working with, I guess, whoever would be in that kind of uh, like the producers and the script writers, whatever. So they have more of an editorial approach to putting things together and probably less of a technical, like a very basic technical approach from what I understand and what I've gathered so far. And I think that's kind of what this white paper is saying is it's recognizing that more editorial role, less like do all the things that we do role. Yeah. And then like, on rereading it, you know, the audio editor cuts and rearranges for clarity and storytelling purposes, which now, like, thinking about it could also include, like, your ums and ahs and even coming down to, like, content editing. As Steve Stewart, who has just jumped into the chat, has talked about, and that where you're making kind of, like, storytelling decisions of, like, is this piece relevant or not? Kind of in this kind of broad definition could fall into that, I think. Mm. So Steve's comment is, My greatest concern about any definition that we finally settle on is how it is perceived by the podcaster that is hiring me. I don't want them to have the wrong idea of what a podcast editor would provide. And I think these super vague titles could like make that really difficult of giving like the podcaster a clear idea of what I do. That's why I call myself an executive producer of awesomeness. (laughs) (laughs) Is that like another issue? Like if we're like, I think it's awesome coming up with your own, like, your own job title, but then that also kind of lends itself to ambiguity in the space and, like, what is what anymore. So, like, is there value in, like, having the role, like, clearly defined, or, like, is it necessary? I think it's really good to have that as a reference point, just so that we can all start talking the same language, or so that if what we do deviates from the norm, that we can communicate that and know what in general people think about, right? And, we, and there's documentation to back that up, put together by a bunch of people that aren't us, right? It's not like we'd sat down and decided, this is what I'm going to call myself and everybody else just has to comply with that. Like very limited representation from indie podcasters, but definitely a large group of people came together to put those definitions together. And I know Steve Stewart, the other director of awesomeness at the Podcast Editors Club, (laughs) has provided some feedback that I think they're going to incorporate. I don't know what that feedback is yet, but I think it really is important for the indie producers and the indie podcasters to be represented well, so that when we're talking to people, we can also speak clearly about what we do and have it sound like it makes sense. It's not just something we made up where we said, I do audio repair. Well, who does that? But yeah, it would be, I think that part of it's good. I'll let you guys talk. I've got a question about it that I want to bring up in a minute, but I don't want to cut you all off. <laughs> now, I think you're making like really good points. And 
even if like we can't agree like this is like the best possible definition, the fact that it, it exists and if nothing else, like worst case scenario, we have a starting point that we can shape to like figure out what or like define this like closer to what the reality of our role is. Yeah. So one of the things I noticed as I was reading through this is I think there's one role that's not audio related that's completely missing from the definitions. And I'm wondering if you guys maybe sense. noticed anything either. Just audio Say, related? No, it's not audio related, but it's something we talked about in the green room because I told you guys that I was talking to a, some people from a company about maybe doing some non-audio work. One of those roles isn't even in there. Is this pertaining to marketing? No, actually. Or like the manager side? No, uh, there's nothing in there about the person that writes the episode notes. There's script writers oh. and there's content editors and there's social media marketing and there's a director of marketing. There's nothing in there about a copywriter for publication. For show notes. Yeah. F so nothing huh. for show notes. I also didn't see anything about email, although I would assume that falls under the marketing director. But I don't know. Wouldn't I didn't, it I didn't all see anything. Wouldn't it all kind of come under marketing? Wouldn't it all either come under marketing or writing? Well, I thought it would come under writing, but all of the writing roles seem to be related to script and narrative mm -hmm. development and that kind of stuff. And the marketing, like the general marketing was all about the overall strategy. And then all of the specific roles were, you know, this person does logging of things and this person does social media and like that kind of thing. But nothing really spoke to that. Well, I feel like the content manager maybe is that person. Or maybe that's because, the case. It's possible I right. missed it. But yeah, that was one of the things uh, I was wondering. It's under administration. It's the content manager is responsible for the distribution of a podcast content within and outside of the episode, including but not limited to clips, newsletter, images, cross promotions, and more. I mean, they just may be the one I pushing the, the button on yeah. sending. But my guess is that the content manager yep. and the production assistant are going to be doing that kind of grunt work. And then if you look at bigger podcasts, they don't have a lot of show notes. They have an episode description, right? But there's not much mm -hmm. that goes with that. At least I know like a lot of like the NPR podcasts, like with the exception of like This American Life where it's, but then they're, they're not actually an NPR podcast, I don't think. They're their own production house, so they do their own thing. But I notice a lot of the bigger podcasts, it's just like a paragraph, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know, so but it, it feels back. like it doesn't take into account the indie podcaster, right? Or not a lot. Yeah. Those, so. Yeah. And I can see what you're saying. Like they consider that grunt work, but I think, I, I do think it's missing. There needs to be like a separate role for like the show notes writer, because I think it is like really important piece of like the production. Especially for the indie podcaster where they're relying on search engine optimization, not mm -hmm. ads and cross promotions on an existing platform for an owned show that's already part of a network, right? Yeah. So I wonder Mo if the mar most, marketing... My, my perception... Because that feels like marketing, right? Does that feel be. like marketing? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I wonder if that's something that they don't just kind of usually farm out to somebody else. So they have an in-house marketing manager maybe who oversees all that stuff to... I mean, I'm just guessing here, so maybe I should just stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the marketing manager also does something through other creative techniques to acquire and retain listeners. Maybe show notes are the other creative techniques to acquire and retain listeners. Steve has a thought in the chat. It's a good one. Steve Stewart, again, the director of awesomeness besides, <laughs> besides <laughs> Jennifer. The definition for show notes writer is under transcriber. They turn the dialogue and audio cues into text, which can be used internally for production processes or displayed publicly. I read the production processes, never really thought about being displayed publicly. And frankly, I got stuck on transcription and was thinking it was... Yeah. Old transcriber there. Yeah. Yeah. Good catch. Well, I like, mean... It can be interpreted. But yeah, when you, when you call it a transcriber, like we know what transcripts is, like they have a clear definition of what a transcript is. So yeah. Yeah. But that seems like that's a little bit more than just transcribing a podcast word for word and then putting it into some sort of document or what have you. Like, there's nothing that annoys me. Okay, this is a pet peeve, but there's nothing that annoys me more than when I go to the show notes and it's nothing but transcription. And I'm like, that's not what I came yes. here oh, for. I hate that. Yeah, yeah. Right. I want a summary and links. Mostly just links. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I've been wondering about this is we could definitely run around with our hair on fire, even though I don't have very much of it and say, oh, the sky is falling. But I think that there are also some benefits or some ways that we could leverage this even right now. But I don't know what they are. What do you guys think? Are there benefits to this being published now that we can then take to our clients or take to the market and say, okay, like let's use this to help raise the business overall, but also ourselves individually? For me, it really is about, okay, here's what I'm doing for you, right? It's this job, this job, this job, this job, and this job. And here's how much I'm going to charge you for it, right? So for that one charge, you're going to get all these things, right? All these skills from me. Yeah. And then thus, all of a sudden, I'm like way more valuable, right? And then it, it, it'll help, especially newer editors, I think should really look at this and understand what they're providing. And if they're providing show notes, if they're providing images or any kind of like those marketing pieces, you know, they can then maybe charge more than $25 an episode kind of thing, like raise their rates up to, and understand personally and communicate that to potential clients that, you know, we're not doing a little bit of work here. This is a lot and it's worth a lot. And it'll save you a lot of time because look at the roles we're taking off your plate now. Yeah. So what you shared sparked a question in me. So I dropped it in the chat, but you talked about the roles, but some of those roles are specific to narrative shows, right? We're not going to have a script writer for an interview show. It's just not going to happen unless we're going to make it narrative. Do we need to then sit down and go, okay, for the kind of production I do, this is what a team would look like if you were to hire individual people mm. so we can share that with them and say, okay, these are all the possible roles. These are the roles that are relevant to what you're producing. These are the roles that we're filling. It's like our own, uh, own paper. Well, uh, yeah. I think someone like myself is kind of overwhelmed by looking at this paper. Me but, too. <laughs> well, there's a lot here that doesn't seem relevant to me. Especially, I'm like, I don't have any audio drama or narrative podcasts at the moment, so 75% of this stuff can be tossed. I mean, as far as how I relate to my clients. So, you know, doing something more streamlined, even, that, yeah, it makes sense to me. It, it, giving it, if I was going to present this to a client, it would definitely need to be streamlined. Yeah. I mean, do we even need to maybe go, okay, for the kind of show that this is? These are the roles that you're filling, right? You're the producer, you're the scheduler, you're doing these roles, these are the parts that we're doing. And I think it it could make the ownership of responsibility really clear. Hmm. I don't know. What do you think? I think it would be helpful especially you know, for writing contracts I wonder if it could too. Help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering like to define like the scope of the project. It's like these roles, like this is what you want, so this is a completely different role hmm. beyond like what I'm charging you for. Yeah. I'm glad we had that conversation because you just kind of helped me turn my hair back not on fire <laughs> by <laughs> answering that question. I threw a bucket of water on you. <laughs> no, because I think this could be really valuable to put into a proposal on a contract and go, these are the roles that I'm filling. These are the roles that you're filling. We're going to work mm -hmm. together. This is a partnership. We are a team, but I'm not going to be the person to call up your guest and ask them why they didn't make it. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is why then it's helpful to have yeah, an so, industry standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. So for me personally, like I wouldn't say that I work with podcasters. I, I work Daniel. with business owners who use podcasting as part of their, you know, marketing. So as far as like typical, like what would interest a podcaster, like it really isn't relevant to my clients. However, when it comes to selling myself, to actually have it like to find out like, here's what I do and like a clear, concise, third party written, but like, here's the value I'm bringing to you. And this is why I'm worth all the money you're going to be paying me. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that being like a huge kind of. Steve <laughs> agrees. If you've got the Steve stamp of approval, we know that it is good. <laughs> <laughs> Which part was he talking about? <laughs> I'm, ass I'm assuming it was the thing about the contracts. <laughs> It's recorded. And this is the Don't value worry. that I'm bringing. Yeah. Scope of the project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What'd I say? I think you said it more. You said the same thing I did, just way more succinctly. <laughs> so. Well, brilliant. 
think it's All my right, turn. So <laughs> our next topic is supercharged growth. And the inspiration of this is the challenges. And when I say challenges, it's like the challenging yourself. So I know Chris Curran had the challenge of like over a certain amount of days, like doing so much to get like high paying clients. I think earlier in the year, like as a mastermind, the topic of like a content challenge of like 30 days of like social media posts with like podcaster tips. So using those challenges to like grow your business. So yeah. Any initial thought? I, I mean, I guess when I thought about this one, what I look back on is most of the times when I've grown the most, either as a podcaster or as an editor or as a business owner, is when I have sadly accepted an external challenge to put focused effort into something for a period of time with the opportunity for very public failure, right? Because <laughs> there's a little bit of fire under my tail mm. to push me forward. But there's also, in the case of some of these, like I put some money into some of this stuff. So I'm going, okay, now I have to justify the 20 or 200 or whatever amount of money I put into this thing. Otherwise, I'm going to feel like a total loser and I don't like that. And so that's how I've found a lot of the growth. And I think that's one of the things we're hoping to be able to offer to people is go, we want your business to grow. Like really, we don't just want to sit here and talk, but we can't actually build your business for you. So what can we do to help you grow your business? And the idea of challenges comes up. I don't know. Does anybody else have different or similar experience? What, what's your experience been? So my experience has been one of complete and utter avoidance of these challenges. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And mainly out of fear. It's like, I know like part of the way I work is like, I have like my comfort zone and like within that comfort zone, like I can do it all day long. But as soon as like I step out of that comfort zone, like I, it's like walking through molasses. So like to do a challenge it's that kind of like putting yourself out there for failure. Like I have a huge fear of that. So like, it's really hard for me to like sign up for these challenges and like be committed just for that fear. But the fact that like I have that fear and I have that struggle kind of tells me that this is something I really need to kind of make a more actually to try. So that way I can do whatever it is. So, like I'm really interested in like creating more content because like we're not using the social media accounts at all right now. And so I want to get better at that. But in order to do that, like I need to get comfortable creating social media content. So I actually was inspired by that challenge. I think Carrie put it out there. I don't know. But it was like the 30 like podcaster tips in 30 days. I think you're up to like 85 now. I last saw. Oh, but me, the other day, yeah. like I just well, kind of okay, got through but together. Before I said that, I had been doing it a while before. I think I just challenged you oh. personally. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I don't remember that one. <laughs> Yeah, no, I do. Well, I remember the conversation. Later, yeah. Several months later, I finally like got a spreadsheet and I threw together like 42 like post ideas that I'm working on fleshing out. So I haven't participated in challenges, but it's definitely something that looking into the new year, I definitely want to have a bigger and like this is something I do want to do next year. So, so Daniel, so if what you is were your, to I'm... do a challenge. Really bad. Uh, Brian, <laughs> what, what, start with you. what challenge would you want to do next year, Daniel? What challenge would you want to do? <laughs> so definitely social media, because I do want to have a bigger social media presence, but then also creating like a video content is something I've been inspired to lately. So maybe some sort of challenge along that. I'm not sure what that'll look like, but that's kind of another thing. Okay. As Carrie wrestles her cat. Yeah. Did you do Chris Curran's challenge a year or two ago that was like one video a week for the month of November or something like that? I was tempted to, but end up not doing it. Okay. That might be, if he does that again, I, I think I'd definitely be part of that. Or if we wanted to do something like that. So I'm curious, Daniel, what is it about the challenges that specifically you fear? <sighs> It's like the fear of the unknown and stepping out of my comfort zone. Okay, so maybe it's part of I don't like not being proficient at something. So doing like just if I if I do something like I want to be good at it. And if I'm not immediately good at it, then I'm uncomfortable and I just don't do it. And I just walk away. Sounds familiar. I don't mean to laugh. <laughs> I'm sure nobody else can relate like to that. That is, that is exactly my son. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I kind of get it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm bad at Which is something a like, lot so, of things. <laughs> so, so to put it out uh, there, 
I'm not saying that that's a good quality of mine, <laughs> but it's if I'm being honest, like that's yeah, that's a weakness that I, that I think challenges could help overcome. I think it means you care about your work, right? Mm-hmm. You care about the end result. But I think challenges aren't about the end result at all. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think I'd like to be clear because I, I talked about growth coming through, you know, the opportunity for failure. The challenges I won't accept <laughs> or that I haven't often accepted are the challenges where I could cause my clients to have a failure. Right. So I have a certain mm. amount of production time that I require in order to get their episodes out. And I can actually do it faster, but I require that. So if there's a buildup of, editing inventory, if you will, I can get it done and not fail to meet their deadlines. But the challenge that I will accept that might be failure are challenges for me to get out in front of people to promote the business or to do that kind of thing. So at some point, I probably have to start having those challenges where I go, okay, can I restrict my production timeline to something that's a little more extreme and still deliver quality results on time? But frankly, I'm not sure I'm interested in that business model. Like, I see more of a craftsman or an artisan style production, even if it still follows a process like an assembly line. I expect to be able to put the effort that's required into them rather than just go, well, I've got 90 minutes to turn this one out. So here's what you get. I don't know. Thoughts? I, I'm confused about what do you mean like challenges that would so like by you taking on this challenge, like you don't have as, not, as much time to focus on your client's work. So something. No, no, be- no. I'm, I'm saying like I will take on challenges to grow an audience or to build a business or to get clients. What I won't do is challenge myself to commit to turning things around, you know, like writing into a contract. I'm now reducing my production timeline to X. So taking two days out of it or taking three days out of it, right? Because there are some clients that will simply not work with me because I don't turn it around as fast as they want. I don't do 24 hour turnarounds. I probably could, but I can't guarantee that I can because that assumes that there's nothing else for me to do when their thing shows up. And that's not the case. There's always a backlog of work. And that's how I work through it and manage the workload is a certain amount of, I I call it unedited inventory that's available for me to work on. Yeah, I don't think I could speed up my production time either. And that does, I mean, if you can have a fast turnaround, that's great, but I can't work that way. Good for the people that can, yeah. you know, they, but then if you need it that fast, you're probably not my client, especially in the no, beginning of the relationship. Mean. It's, there's a lot to like learning yeah. a new client, but I don't know where I was going with that. Just that that's just not for me. I will do it as a one-off. If a client comes to me and says, Hey, like, I'm sorry, I couldn't get this to you sooner. Can you turn it around? If I can, I'll turn it around. If I can't, I just, I hope I'm you sorry. charge them extra. Yeah. <laughs> But if I can't do it, I just simply can't do it. Like I like Brittany's approach, Brittany Felix, where if you don't get it in on time, you simply get it late. But I don't actually want to enforce that if I can deliver it. But the next time I may not be able to. Like if I've already got three episodes that I'm working on that are due at about the same time, I'm going to give preferential treatment to the people that had their work in on time. Yeah. I just had a client who emailed me this afternoon and said, if I get you an episode, you know, when do I need to get you an episode by in order to have it done by the 21st? And I think my response was yesterday. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, but I think challenges, aside from the challenges of just, you know, doing this work, I think... Putting yourself in a situation where you're outside of your comfort zone, but then you're also supported Mm -hmm. with others and you're doing it with others and you can commiserate and get ideas from others. There's something very valuable in that. And I think I have done that not just with my business here. I've done it like for other things. And every time I do a challenge, I grow and I learn. So, Carrie, you mentioned group and support. Are you one of the people that prefers to do a challenge with a group of people? Do you prefer like a mentor or coach type relationship? Like, are you a group person or a one-on-one person? I think I'm a group person. I totally think I'm a group person. What about you, Jennifer and Daniel? Are you group people or... How about Jennifer? Because I think Jennifer. you're both waiting for the other one to talk. <laughs> like, huh? Let's communicate here. So, Jennifer, okay. you go first. Okay. The only challenge 
like what we're talking about that I participated in is February album writing month, which the challenge is to write 14 songs in 28 days. Whoa. Yeah, I don't do it anymore, but I did that for like 10 years straight every February. And the community that comes out of that is the reason to participate. I mean, yeah. because I've met people from around the world that have actually been on a podcast of a guy I met through farming just because I was tinkering with songwriting. And he was in the community. I'm in the community. We're friends on Facebook. Now I've been on his podcast. So definitely the community around challenges. I signed up for Chris Curran's recent challenge. I did nothing. Well, (laughs) uh so that was a wash. You know, you Um, still have access to go back and review the materials and start whenever, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just. Let her get through the holidays first before we tease her about it. I want to pressure right now. So she hates me forever. (laughs) But anyway, to answer the question <laughs> about group and individuality, uh, definitely the community that around challenges is phenomenal. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. I did them. So I did challenges in the scrapbooking community way back when, where we and in January, and I know they're still doing it. It's a scrapbook page a day, and it's you have like they give you a prompt and you do it every, you know a different prompt every day and let me tell you it was a lot of fun not we weren't going for the best work right we were just going for the practice because daniel a challenge is a great way to be able to practice a skill instead of master it Mm -hmm. daniel (laughs) <laughs> That's my struggle. <laughs> yeah. Don't go listen to my 14 songs from 28 Days. They're definitely not skillfully mastered. Right. Like nothing I've done in a challenge has been my best work, but it's given me that experience and it's allowed me to take that experience and then refine it in the future and give me the confidence to then go do that thing well. The, I just have like a realization that might come up later in the episode, but we'll circle back to that. Oh, now I'm now I'm intrigued. You, yeah, you can't that just say that. Gap. No, no, it's the next point. But, it's like a couple so, points down. We'll get to it. We'll get it's to it. A couple points down. To the <laughs> Wait, we I had a list. To kinda key, <laughs> I wanted to kind of key back in what on what Carrie and Jennifer said, though, because last year, I don't know, one of those years, I did the whole national podcast post month thing in November. So it's 30 podcast episodes in 30 days. They don't have to be one per day, but that's how it ends up working out. And I did that not for the purpose of growing an audience necessarily or anything. It was all about growing my voice as a solo podcaster, doing short form content. And I felt like it accomplished that. What I didn't get out of that, that you guys got out of yours was that sense of community. Because frankly, I was so burned out after 30 days of doing that, (laughs) that there was no community. (laughs) I was a hermit. But But I feel like that challenge, like I wouldn't even know where to go. Like, is there a community around that challenge? Well, there's a Facebook group or something that you can be part of. Oh. But I could never, <laughs> like when I'm doing the recording for my episode of the day at 11.30 p.m., oh, yeah. like I'm not going to pop back in after a day of day job plus production work plus balancing the books. And then at the end of the day, I also do this five minute episode. It was good. I grew. I definitely got better, I think. But I did not get that sense of community, and I really felt like I kind of missed out on that. Uh, Believe it or not, I actually do like people. I don't always pretend like it, but (laughs) (laughs) I actually kind of do like people. So to answer your question about like what kind of like challenges I like, I think I prefer like the privacy of like a smaller, it's like within a mastermind or within like a small private group. Because like the point Carrie made about having like the support and accountability is very useful. And just kind of help you along the way. So I think I prefer that because I'm kind of shy by nature. So I, I don't like being public about things. But I uncomfortably will admit that I probably would get more value out of a more public group challenge to build that kind of community and relationships out of it. Or like whatever it is, can just kind of grow my business by just being more public about it or my brand or whatever. And I would argue that it's uncomfortable for everybody. So you're not sure, sure, alone sure. in that discomfort. And that in itself is worth you know, it's worth seeing that, like, you're not alone in that feeling. There's something amazing. Like, we just did, for the podcast fellowship, we just did pitches for our show ideas to some, like, you know, kind of well-known people. 
And yeah, it was super uncomfortable. And I feel like I failed miserably just in, you know, whatever. But I didn't, you know, the experience of going through that with others who were in the exact same situation I was, who were just as vulnerable as I was, it didn't feel like a failure. It felt like a learning moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of valuable insight from like, not just the people I pitched to, but like the people like leading the class and my classmates, right? And then the fun thing, I think one of the funnest things is then I get to see like what they were doing, right? And how they were implementing the things that we learned, which, you know, sparked more ideas in me, right? Seeing people who had similar challenges as I do and a similar way of being and how they approach their work. So yeah, it is like, I love challenges. I really do. So should we mention why we're talking about challenges now? Or should we hold that until later? Like, what, what do you guys think? Should we spill the beans? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Why not? Okay. Yeah. So we're bringing this up now because we keep hearing over and over when we ask people, what are you struggling with? As people join the, our group, at the podcast editors mastermind group, or join the email newsletter, nobody responds with, you know, I can't figure out how to cut out ums. And very few people say things like, I'm not quite sure how to work with Adobe Audition or whatever DAW they're using. Most of us are proficient in the editing part of the thing. But what we keep hearing is, I struggle to charge what I'm worth, or I can't find clients, or I'm not sure how to grow and scale my business, things like that. And we want to see that change. We want to see that change for you. And so we're trying to go, okay, what can we do to help you build your business? Because we can't find you clients necessarily. I mean, we'll refer clients that make sense as best we can, but we can't really do that. So what can we do? Well, we'd like to help you by offering a challenge. Anybody want to say anything about that? I kind of ended abruptly. <laughs> you need somebody to like pick up? Yeah. So we thought we'd put together a five-day challenge because obviously... That is kind of a bite-sized way to get you kind of comfortable with making yourself uncomfortable, Daniel. <laughs> Why are you picking on Daniel? You can pick on me. <laughs> I feel like my 2021 word of the year is going to be uncomfortable. I think it should. <laughs> or discomfort. It, it will now. Feeling now. Yeah. Yeah. So we're basically going to challenge you to do things that we know for sure lead to growth and clients. And it might not necessarily be what you expect. And it might be uncomfortable, but it's not going to be something you'll do alone. And it's something that I need to get back to it. Like we all need a little refresher mm -hmm. um, with these things. And it's, you know, I think it's something that the more you practice it, the better you get at it. Yeah. So that's all I got on that. I don't know. Like, we will have more specifics on the challenge in the next couple of weeks when Carrie takes a vacation. In Do we know a when vacation it's to work on this. Yes. So <laughs> it's going to, in January. I don't know if we talked a specific date yet. We haven't yet. Okay. So I would imagine. All right. So in January, and this episode okay. will come out. Hopefully in December. <laughs> No, well, this one is, so it's scheduled to come out the 31st, which is New Year's Eve. So perhaps when everybody's getting back to work that first week of January, we'll start the challenge. Awesome. Yeah. And, I, and I'm I, assuming they can sign up for the newsletter and stay up to date whenever we... Yeah. <laughs> that, that's where my head was too. And yeah. <laughs> well, where can they go, Brian, to get on that newsletter? Well, you can go to the podcast editors mastermind.com. And in the header, there's a little button to sign up for the. E Actually, no, just scroll down the page and it'll put, has a little email thing. Just put in your email address and tell us that you want to get the thing, and we'll send you <laughs> fancy <laughs> GIFs and silly limericks and all kinds of resources. And when it's time, we'll also send you the information about this challenge. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I got. I'm bad at words. I know it's hard to believe, but... <laughs> <laughs> you told us you'd have a lot. I was kind of banking on that. Uh, so I do. I, I mean, I could keep talking. <laughs> it's possible. It may not be on this topic, however. <laughs> and I've got cat hair in my lip gloss, so... 
<laughs> so do you guys want to finish out with our pod decks random question of the week? Yeah. What is it, Brian? Yeah. So absolutely us? not sponsored by pod decks. If they don't even know we're doing this, please don't tell them. They might tell us to stop. <laughs> the question for this week is if you had a personal mascot, what would it be? Carrie, you go first. Yeah, a cat. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. Yeah, a cat. What about you, Daniel? I had a hard time with this one. I think the closest thing I came up with is a tortoise, just from like the tortoise and the hare, just slow and steady. Because I feel like kind of describes this year has just been slow and steady, making it through, and then kind of at the end, just kind of like thriving. Yeah. Well, what about you, Jennifer? One? Personal mascot. <sighs> Some people would assign me a sloth. A sloth? <laughs> wow. Okay. No, what would you assign yourself? Come yeah. on. Mm. Yeah, well, that's what I was given a sloth calendar for Christmas <laughs> last year. Even <laughs> It's hanging on my wall. I can see it from here. So it's like. I would disagree because eh. when you put your mind to doing something, you just do it. Like. Yep. You just work through it. Yeah, but it takes me a long time <laughs> to get around to putting my mind to doing something. So that's not the most motivational. No, uh, but I would like option. And you already took cat. I mean, so. I, like I don't have ownership of mascots. <laughs> so <laughs> if you look at college sports, I think there's like 20 teams that have the tiger mascot. So I, I think we can have two editors that have a cat. Or well, you I'll could be, be a, a tiger. Cat, yeah. 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 I could just be a lazy house because cat, a plump little house you cat. You could be a lazy house cat. <laughs> Even big cats. So let's say I'm a tiger. All right. They still lay around and do nothing a lot. Right. Of and, right. When then, and then when they when kill stuff. Right. But they, <laughs> they like, they really go after it. Like, yeah. it's, it's they like, really kill stuff. yeah. They really <laughs> kill stuff. Okay. There we go. I'll be a tiger then. So I'm, right, Brian, I'm intrigued that all of you chose real things to be your mascot. <laughs> oh, like a chair would not be. <laughs> no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking of animals. So yeah. when I thought mascot, the first thing that came to mind, I gave myself two mascots, and but they're a pair. I gave myself Pinky and the Brain because I feel like every morning I get up and say to myself, <laughs> now what are we going to do today, Brain? Try to take over the world. <laughs> That's just yeah. like my approach. I don't know. I guess we'll take over the world. Awesome. Oh, Oops. I love that. Uh oh. And Steve sent us a link. I can't click on the link right now, but Men's Papa Bear Crusher. We'll we'll have to look that up later. It's in the yeah, chat. It's in the if you joined us for the podcast and not for the live video, you definitely want to go see all of the behind the scenes oh, and great. grab the links, which are at facebook.com slash podcast editors mastermind, because you, you're going to want to see this one. It's pretty special. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quote unquote special. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like Pinky in the Brain, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great idea in, pract in principle, practice not so much. Well, if you want to talk about cartoon character mascots, I'll go with Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Oh, there that's great. Yeah, let's do Rocky the Flying that? Squirrel. Yeah, I like that one. Dude, right, I'm like, oh, well, I wasn't thinking outside the box like that. I was thinking of... Is this another one of those things that I... What was it? What? What is your new mascot? Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Oh, Rocky flying it's from squirrel. Rocky and okay. Bullwinkle, right? I thought you said wonky. I'm like, <laughs> no. Is that, no, I remember Rocky. Wow. Rocky. Are, are you in Eastern time too, Daniel? Is that the deal? No, I know no, you're central. I don't like have me. that excuse. <laughs> yeah. Nobody picked Nobody picked <laughs> <laughs> Steve, we, take we, it we back. left that for you. <laughs> I mean, that's our collective mascot. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, our collective mascot is right. <laughs> I think of y'all whenever I see anything Yeti. So I do too. It, it works, but you know. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's what my husband has called you guys for a long time. Like, are you doing Yetis tonight? <laughs> 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 that's fantastic. So. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for this week. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to let everybody know what they can do if they want to be a guest on the show? If you want to be a guest on the show, you can go to podcasteditormastermind.com slash be a guest and fill out the form and be our guest. Hey. And can I jump awesome. in for We're just a second? looking for experts and people yeah. looking for help. We've seen from time to time in Facebook groups, people are asking for something to practice on. 
If you want mm. some audio to practice on, let us know because we put together the audio for one of our previous episodes and we'll make that available for you. Just hit us up, podcasteditorsmastermind.com. Send us an email. We'll hook you up. Mm -hmm. All right. Brian really yeah. does not want and, to edit this episode, by the way. No, no, I'm not talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about the one from like three weeks ago, the one that I added live on Facebook. So you can go back and make fun uh, of how I did it. It's all there, but you get the raw audio. So you get to edit out all the times I bumped my microphone and you get all of that, <laughs> all that good stuff to get that practice. It's all there for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's And there's no pressure because it's not going to be the live version. So you don't have to worry about, it actually really is good practice. Yeah. I've sent it to Sorry, like three people this week. <laughs> Because oh, wow, they're like, nice. hey, does anybody have something I can practice on? I'm like, well, I can't share my client in episodes, but here, practice on this. <laughs> and, sorry, All Steve, it's 9. not 9.6 gigabytes of audio. For those that don't know, Steve edited one of our episodes. It was an hour and a half long, <laughs> nine gigs. He let us know about it. We it like immediately changed our process because of Steve's feedback because we trust him because he is the other director of awesomeness. Yes. <laughs> And one of the benefits of being a guest on the show is you do have the opportunity to edit the previous week's episode. So if you do want a chance to practice and with feedback on air, this episode, if you want to be, <laughs> you can always sign up to be a guest and you'll have the opportunity to edit an actual episode. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for tuning in once again. This has been a blast. You can find the show notes and everything at podcasteditorsmastermind.com. And I am Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. I'm Brian Ensminger. You can find me at toptieraudio.com. And I'm Jennifer Longworth, bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. And we'll see you next year. Next, <laughs> next year, 2021. Bye. 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 Ah. Uh, um, so how much is that? Um, 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 um